Closing the Gap, 50 Years Seeking Equal Pay is made possible by the Eden Hall Foundation seeks to improve the quality of life in Pittsburgh and southwestern Pennsylvania. Through the lens of women's issues, it continues the stewardship of Sebastian Mueller in the areas of human services, health, education, and the arts. And by Chatham University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has empowered women for 145 years, advancing women's causes with their Centers for Women in Politics, Entrepreneurship, and the new Chatham University Women's Institute opening in 2015. And these additional donors. Kathy Raphael, Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney, PC, Georgia Berner, MSA, and the Women and Girls Foundation. Hello and welcome to the special Closing the Gap presentation, Negotiation Know-How, Clearing the Hurdles to Making the Ask. I'm your host, Tonya Caruso. Statistics show that women earn less money over the course of a lifetime than men. And one of the reasons why may be that women are less likely than men to negotiate. And that's our focus today, helping you to build the skills you need to, to ask for and earn what you're worth. We'll also tell you how to avoid the stereotypes and backlash that can hold women back. And we want you to be a part of this conversation too. So send us your questions and comments. Our social media team is standing by and they'll get your questions to our experts here in the studio. And we have some great experts. I'm very happy to welcome today's experts. First, we have Ayana Ledford. She is the founding executive director of PROGRESS, which stands for the Program for Research and Outreach on Gender Equity in Society. We're also very happy to welcome Leanne Meyer. She is an executive coach and the program director of the Carnegie Mellon Leadership and Negotiation Academy, headquartered in Pittsburgh. Welcome to both of you. We are so glad that you are here. Thank you, happy to Thank be here. You. This is such an important topic. And Ayana, I wanna start with you and let me begin by asking you how this idea of not wanting to negotiate or being afraid to ne negotiate and women's attitudes, how that impacts the gender wage gap. Yes, so sound academic research uh, found that the propensity for women to not negotiate, how that plays a role in the wage and leadership gap. And by not making, not making the ask for what you're worth and what you're valued, you start off making a less amount of money and may not be afforded the same leadership opportunities that grow, have the potential to grow your professional portfolio, and that adds up over time. Right, and so Leanne, what do we know then about women versus men mm -hmm. when it comes to negotiating mm -hmm. and, it w and when it comes to making the mm -hmm. ask? Tonya, what's sad is that our research shows that men are more likely, four times more likely than women are to make the ask when it comes to issues of what we would call self-advocacy. So when it comes to salary, promotion, stretch assignments, a man is more likely, four times more likely than a woman to make the ask. And so then when women do make the ask, mm -hmm. does research show anything about how women do compared to men when making the ask? Yes, so women who ask on behalf of others or organizations that they care for will make a very competitive ask. But when it comes to themselves and they do negotiate, they have a tendency to undervalue their skills and end up asking for less and leave a lot on the table. Right. So Leanne, does this mean that women don't know how to do this? No, well the research supports women clearly know how to negotiate. They're not good at negotiating for themselves. So as, as Ayana was pointing out, the research shows when women are negotiating on behalf of others, their teams, their families, for resources, for groups of people, they're phenomenal negotiators. When it comes to making the ask for themselves, first of all they don't ask and research shows probably they, they are sort of 30% less than anyone else would ask for themselves. And then we know, and I'm sure we'll probably be discussing it, is that they experience a backlash when they do ask. And, and is backlash probably one of the number one reasons as to why? Yeah, the reluctance to make the ask is based on the fear of maybe not being likable or um, their team looking at them a certain, through a certain lens because there's certain gender stereotypes placed on women and which is embedded within our social fabric. 
Right. So I, if I could add, I, I think backlash is one of the reasons we don't ask, but a lot of us don't understand there is a backlash. Mm -hmm. I think the other reasons we don't ask, I think many of us have been socialized to be good girls or nice girls or kind girls, which means we don't ask, we don't stir up things. And then I think thirdly, we don't know we should ask. Mm -hmm. I, I think so often we don't have the mentors we need and we don't understand the rules of the game. So we, we're thinking we're going to be given a promotion or someone's going to notice our work not realizing that our male colleagues are probably in that office four times more often than we are asking for the promotion or asking for the next stage in their career. So I think it's a combination of socialization, not understanding the rules often in the environments we operate in, as well as an understanding that there is a backlash. Yeah, so I think right. it's all three of those. Yeah. Recognizing all the opportunities to ask. Mm -hmm. Let me sum summarize it. There's a lot of things to ask for beyond even just your salary. Right, and so you touched on this earlier mm -hmm. uh, about how, you know, if you're not doing this from the time you're young and mm -hmm. starting your career, are there any dollar amounts or quantifiable figures as to how much a woman could potentially stand to lose, not just in salary, but in retirement, if there's mm -hmm. a matching 401k, that sort of thing? I think for us, Linda, Professor Linda Babcock from Carnegie Mellon is the founder of both our organizations and her research shows, and, and she just takes one number and she said if you leave $10,000 on the table in the mm -hmm. beginning of your salary, over your career you've really lost $500,000. So it's half a million dollars you've left on the table because you didn't negotiate your very first job. And that's based on increases, it's based on contributions to your retirement plans and, and so, so the number is significant if you're not asking right from the get-go. Yeah. Right. And, and is there a point where um, it's too late? Like, do you reach a certain point in your career and, and it's it's too late? Oh, no. You should always continue to negotiate. Uh, it is never too late. So you could be still working at 60 and realize that you needed an adjustment in your salary. Go ahead and ask for it. I mean, the worst you could hear is no, and you need to get comfortable hearing that, and it's not so bad, because at least you made a stand and asked for your value. You're not wondering, what if I will have done something? Right, and, and do you think it's one of these things? That number is shocking. Do you leave 10,000 on the table, mm. what it grows to? Mm. Mm. And this is one of those things, women, we probably aren't, we don't think this way. No. We don't think of the no. accumulative factors. Yeah. No. I, I think we're not thinking of the impact over a career. We're not thinking when we leave a company and go to another company that ask what our starting salary is from the company that we were in. We're not thinking of every bonus is calculated as a percentage of that salary. So no, we're not thinking of the knock-on effects at all. Yeah, well, we have so much great, we have so many great things to get to and talk about. And we'll continue the conversation with our guests, Leanne Meyer and Leanna Ford. And we'll take your questions coming through our social media but first, let's learn more about the growing body of research that explains how and why women are holding back when it comes to negotiating in the workplace. Men are more likely to describe negotiation like winning a ball game, some kind of athletic contest, something you really look forward to. And women had very different emotional reactions to thinking about negotiation. They likened negotiation to going to the dentist. So we don't like Dr. Linda Babcock is an economist and one of the nation's leading experts on women and negotiating styles. She's also the author of the acclaimed book, Women Don't Ask. So my research tells me that women are actually great negotiators. Women negotiate very strongly when it's on behalf of somebody else. So it's not that women don't have the negotiation skills, it's just that they tend to not use them on their own behalf. Women are much more likely than men to believe that if they just work hard, keep their nose down, and perform well, that that behavior will be recognized and that they'll be promoted on that. Dr. Babcock's research showed this hesitancy to negotiate holds true for all women regardless of age, race, education, or job type. So women are settling when it comes to salaries, which begs the question, why? You know, we have a whole set of words that we reserve for women we think are too aggressive. And I'm not sure I should say them on the air. They're not very nice words, but we don't have those words for men. We call men ambitious, and it's a good thing. Don't believe there's a backlash against women who are seen as being too aggressive? Check this out. Dr. Babcock and researchers at Carnegie Mellon University conducted an experiment. They videotaped actors, one male, one female, negotiating a raise at work. Both actors used the exact same script. I understand that there's a range in terms of how much managers are paid in their first placement, 
I think I should be I paid, at the, should paid at the top range. of that range. And Focus I groups evaluated how the man and the woman asked for the raises. People thought that the man was just fine. They liked him. They wanted to hire him. I think I should be paid at the top of that range. I think I should be paid at the top of that range. And I would both also like to male and female participants in our study watching these videos both thought that the woman was too aggressive and didn't like her as a result of the negotiations. Well, it, it wasn't, wasn't clear, clear to me whether we aren't just saying, oh, it's just men that are the problem. It's all of us. It's how we as a society judge women that we think are too aggressive. Congratulations on your promotion. Through this experiment, researchers developed more effective language to help women sidestep the double standard. It's a softer approach Dr. Babcock calls a relational style. I enjoy working hard. For example, one of our scripts says, you know, I know it may not be customary for someone in my role to be negotiating their salary, but I hope that you see my willingness and ability to negotiate as something I'm bringing as an asset to the company. And so that strategy is showing, look, I've thought about how you're seeing this, and there's something in this for you. And people thought that was perfectly appropriate. They liked the women. And so that was one of our success stories. And when I say it was a success story, I sort of have mixed feelings about that. Because on one hand, we did find scripts that were successful for women. On the other hand, this is totally not fair of our society to have to make women work so hard to, to do the same thing that men are not being judged very harshly for at all. If we want to really reduce the wage gap or eliminate it entirely, we have to stop doing that. We have to decide that we celebrate assertive women, that we like that, that we reward it, that we encourage people to do that and stop judging them so negatively. That has to happen or else we'll never get to where we want to be as a society with true equality. So women have a lot of information to consider as they build skills for more successful negotiations. And that's what we're talking about today with our guests, Leanne Meyer. She's an executive coach and the program director of the Carnegie Mellon Leadership and Negotiation Academy for Women. And Ayanna Ledford, who is the founding executive director of PROGRESS, which stands for the Program for Research and Outreach on Gender Equity in Society. And remember, we also want to hear from you and our social media team has already received some questions. We'll get to them in a moment, but first I wanna go back to what we saw in our video here. Um, it says that research suggests, and you've touched on this, that women sometimes feel that high quality work will be recognized and rewarded without their asking. Do you find in the workshops that you run with women that this is true? Yes, I've asked women in the workshops I hosted, whether they're in um, women in engineering or women in electric, or even women who are working at a sales desk. They feel as though if I put in the hours, if I stay late from work, if I volunteer, a lot of time the volunteering that they're doing has nothing to pertain in terms of their professional development, I will be recognized and rewarded through my salary. So do you break their hearts when you say, no, that's not the case? We do, because I, I think the res what the research does show is that if, if life was long, big grad school, women would do unbelievably well. If we <laughs> work hard and get our grades that are great, we would do well. And I, I think we, we call it the tiara syndrome. People yeah. sit down in a corner waiting for someone to come and place a tiara on their head and go, well done, you know, and throw a party. It's, it's, it, is, it is sad to think that the good work is not enough, that we, mm -hmm. we have to advocate for ourselves and we have to to network and do all the things that we know are important to accelerate a women's career. So we, we do break their hearts and I think there's frustration that it's not based on women. Right. Okay, let's mm -hmm. go to our social media team and take a question. This message is from Tyler who contacted us through Twitter. Tyler wants to know, should salaries be negotiated based on job titles within a company or should salary be based on the effort I put into the job and the quality of my work? Ah, good question. Titles, lots of people do yeah. things by titles. So it depends really on the company, I mm, think. Exactly. I mean, literally, if some companies put a lot of value on the title, then you should really be looking at negotiating that title to get out of maybe a certain grade level so you could get that um, wage adjustment. Some companies don't even care really about the title, um, but realistically, you hope that the company was transparent enough that your you know, salary or your opportunities are based on the skills and performance that you've done f and results you've gained or the results that you've garnered for the company's behalf. Mm -hmm. 
I, I think that the struggle, I, you know, there's been a lot of talk now with people saying some jobs should be non-negotiable, it should be set on the value of the job, not on what someone brings. I, I think it depends very much on the goals of the organization. If, if the goals are around performance, a lot of the value of the job should be based linked to performance. I think it's hard to have one specific way of valuing a job. I think there are multiple ways depending on the culture and the goals of an organization. Right. Let's take another social mm -hmm. media question. Jasmine asked this question through Twitter. In addition to the dollar figure, what other items should be considered when negotiating a salary? Oh, good question. Mm -hmm. Addition, I mean, there's so many things. It depends on really, what is your goal? What do you really want? So, I mean, if you're commuting, is it um, reimbursement for your travel to and from work? Or is it flex time? Is it additional money in your um, retirement plan? Is your health benefits, you know, what costs is the company paying on your behalf? Office space. You gotta think about what would make you happy and satisfied there and feel valued and then network and communicate with others and find out what really is realistic to get. Um, so there's a lot of things that are negotiable. It depends on really what are you hoping to achieve and what will make your life feel successful at the company. I think that, and I think linked to that purely from a negotiation strategy mm -hmm. perspective, we would advise women to never make a negotiation purely about one item. So it should never just be about salary because mm -hmm. I think for so many women, they want to maintain relationships. And when we get to one item, it's hard to maintain a relationship because it becomes a yes, no, adversarial or not. Where if we're negotiating a package of options, as Ayan has mentioned, benefits and flexibility and leave, you can always give this, but take this, add this, come back to that. And so I think it helps women feel that they maintaining relationship while negotiating for themselves and and uh, so I think it would, it's just always a good idea not to limit it purely to one number that has to do with salary. Right. Before we take our mm -hmm. next social media question I, I want to ask you the question you both work with a wide range of women mm -hmm. um, through the work that you do mm -hmm. and do you find that some women are more likely to negotiate than others or and are there things that that set the negotiators apart um, education level, yeah. Yeah. job sector, yes. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah the, uh, the education level plays a role. Uh, the more educated you are, it's more likely that you feel the ability to negotiate. Um, depending on the level of the company you're in, the higher level, you feel more room to negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, and I've worked with both executive women, but also women who are maybe in the service industry. And it comes down to, they don't even realize that they have mm -hmm. the ability to negotiate because they don't see, they feel oh, I'm thankful to even been offered this job mm -hmm. versus someone who's at this executive level saying, you should be grateful to have me yeah. here in this position. They see yeah. more power and the ability to influence and make decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I, I would agree. I, th I think it, uh, we, sh we see absolutely the, the more educated a woman is, the more aware she can, the more powerful she feels, the more she feels she can negotiate. But I think it's always shocking, even at a place like Carnegie Mellon, where we have remarkable graduates coming out and often not fully understanding that they could be negotiating their first job. So I, I think it's, it, it has to do with exposure and power and education, yeah. but, but it's still shocking, the number of women who feel they couldn't even or shouldn't have or didn't even think to negotiate. Right. Yeah. Okay, let's take another social media question. All right, we have Shannon from Facebook, and she's asking, what action steps should you take when it seems that you're being underpaid? Well, one of the first action steps I would say is to make sure your research is in place to make sure that mm -hmm. is the case. And one of the things I always tell people that I'm working with is that you've, you have your current job description. Um, you could pretty much recreate your new job description and see how that's changed and really compare the two to see if there is, need, is there a need to be a cost adjustment or a pay adjustment to your current position. But really make sure it's not based on hearsay and rumors mm -hmm. and that you've done some real research to find out if that's truly the case. Yeah. And I think a great resource on the website for this program, you have different salary websites that people could click to to actually look at salaries. So I think you would, you would always start with the research and making sure on, on a more neutral site, go in, type in your jobs, as you suggested, and see, and this website for your program has fabulous links for that. Right. Yeah. So before we get into the specifics, because I want to know exactly what you say, <laughs> um, we did have another question from social media that I wanted to read to you, and it is from Cynthia, and she reached us through Twitter, and Cynthia asks, are there different expectations involved with negotiating salary with a male boss versus a female boss? And if there are, what can I do to help me prepare to negotiate in consideration of my boss's gender? 
is there a difference? This is complicated enough. Yeah. Um, n no. Um, really, you should approach the negotiation whether the, it's a male boss or a female boss the same way, um, which is very strategic and thoughtful and um, well planned, uh, regardless of the gender. And I think if I could add, which to me is mm -hmm. sad as, as, as a group of women sitting yeah. here, is that we know the backlash against women who negotiate comes equally from men and women bosses. Mm -hmm. so, so I think we often, there may be a, a misperception that if we're negotiating with a woman boss, they would be more understanding, they may know our discomfort, but, but the, the research really does not support that. In fact, a lot of women I think are often more concerned mm -hmm. around negotiating with women because gender is always at play and you can there's a way to negotiate with a man and there's a way to negotiate right. potentially with a woman. And we yeah. actually have some statistics okay. that we'll put up on the screen yeah. um, related to this question. And one study asked respondents if they thought they stood a better chance negotiating a salary raise with a male boss or a female boss. And of the total respondents, 24% said they thought they'd stand a better chance of negotiating a raise if they had a male boss. 8% chose a female boss and the remaining respondents felt the gender of the boss wouldn't make any difference. But um, looking at the statistics when respondents are broken down by gender, 28% mm -hmm. of the women said they thought they'd stand a better chance of getting a raise if the boss were a male. Nearly one third of women polled seem to hold biases about women bosses. Mm -hmm. and, and so is this just this backlash coming mm -hmm. around again? Yeah, it's, this, it's the perception, you know. I, I think it's the backlash, and I think it, it's, it's a lovely indicator of, a, of the double bind women work. When we act, what we struggle with at work is when we act according to our stereotype, which would not be the boss. The stereotype is not women in leadership positions. We're supposed to be thoughtful, caring, kind, nice. Team builders, collaborative, when we act out of our stereotype, which we often have to do to work in environments, or some of us are just not the stereotypical women, when we act out of the stereotype, we are seen as all, all the negative words right. people have used, and we're seen as very strident. And, and so, absolutely, I think you're seeing both the backlash and you're seeing all our unconscious biases at play in workplaces. Yes. So then the big question is, mm. How do you ask, and what yes. happens when the boss says no right yes. off the bat? Yeah. Yes. So the, the thing is, I always what's great is that I'll go to a workshop and I'll ask, how many of you, when we have very bright and strong women, and I said, how many of you negotiate your salary? And a lot of hands go up. I said, well, how many of you negotiated and got what you want immediately? And their hands are still raised proudly. And I said, oh, you didn't hear a no? And they go, no, I didn't. And I go, well, just think how much you lost on the table. You know, so when you hear a no, consider that to be a good thing because you go always and ask, what needs to happen for me to hear a yes? Maybe there's some sort of deficits in my skills or I need some sort of training. Um, maybe there's limitations in their budget. And when you go into a negotiation, you also have to be willing to walk away. So you know that if you don't get what you want, um, are you willing to leave the place or what is, you know, what are you willing to settle for? So you have all that planned out in advance and you're prepared. Uh, so preparation and practice makes you a very strong and effective negotiator. Yeah, well, we'll continue this on the yeah. other side. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll continue to talk about the skills you need for more successful negotiations in the workplace. But first, as part of this Closing the Gap campaign, we've asked you to send your questions and comments to us via videos uploaded on our YouTube channel. And we want to share a couple of questions with you now. Hello, I'm Stephanie from Ohio, and my two cents about women in the workforce and having equal pay is to definitely stand up for yourself. Do not be afraid to ask for your review and do not be afraid to ask for your raise, especially if you deserve it. I've made that mistake going into a job where I had five years experience doing essentially the same thing that I was being hired for, but they still hired me at the going rate, even though I definitely deserved more. I should have stood up for myself, and I definitely made that mistake, but it's a lesson learned, and I want more girls to know about this, that they should stand up for themselves. There's absolutely nothing wrong with advocating for yourself. Thanks for your comment. We also want to share a question submitted via our YouTube channel. Hi, um, my name is Fiona and I'm from California. Do you find that you have to ask for raises and have you experienced repercussions for doing so? So thanks for your time. 
Okay, so oh, Leanne, we'll go back to you from yes, the last. Yes, I think Tanya just linked to you know when you're saying how do you ask and what if you said no. Ayana spoke to no, and just based on these videos, I, and there'll be pushback maybe from from you sitting here and probably from the viewers as well is. When women ask, the research supports we do have to ask differently to how men ask. And, th and this is where there's often real mm -hmm. unhappiness for all the women we work with is when women ask, there are two things that need to be different. The first is they can't just ask for themselves. They need to legitimize their ask. So if I'm asking for something, I need to explain how it's linked to something bigger. So if I'm saying, I'm asking for a salary increase, as the women asked. You have to link to your, why your research shows that maybe you're worthy of that research, or you've got to point to all the different targets you achieved. So we often have to explain why we're asking. A man can come and say, you know, I'd like a raise, and, and that's acceptable. When a, a woman can't just say, I'd like a raise, she needs to legitimize why, mm -hmm. and the reason has to be linked to some reason bigger than just herself. Mm -hmm. And How many times can you go back to the well? If your boss says no, I mean, you said take the action steps of finding out Mm -hmm. um, am I lacking in some skills? Yes. Am I doing something wrong? Yeah. Yeah. When does no really mean no eventually? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think people know when no means no. I think they tend to think it means no too quickly. I think there are ways to come back. And I think what's very important for salary, salary asks is never to wait until the annual review. I think we wait till it's too late. We yeah. wait till we're sitting opposite our boss and we've been given what we're receiving and then we want to ask for a raise. I think it's it's a consistent process of advocating for yourself. It's when you hit a target, remind someone that you hope this is considered as, you know, when they're looking at raises. Uh, when you do something great at work, remind them that you're looking for a raise. So I, I think the conversation happens consistently. So by the time you're sitting there, the ask is easier and you're more persuasive. Right. And if I could just add a second point, and this is what's really frustrating, is, is as I said, you need to legitimize your ask. You also need to do it in what Sue Common from University of Michigan calls a relentlessly pleasant way or mm. niceness with insistence. And so I think it's also important when women often hear no, they get very disappointed and very frustrated and we often let that show. And that's not helpful when we're negotiating our increases. So I think it's very important. Niceness insistence with insistence is a good one is to keep insisting, but to always maintain your, your calm, your composure and do it in a pleasant fashion as opposed to getting very upset about it. Do the same rules apply across the board for all industries or as our viewer um, was asking in sort of like maybe a field that's that's dominated by men, is yeah. the approach different or is it the same thing across the well, board? It's the same across the board really because regardless um, both men and women hold the same um, implicit biases when it comes to women and their approach. So mm. I, you know, picking back on what Leanne was saying about, you know, the way you approach the negotiation, it, it needs to be much more of a cooperative approach. But actually that approach benefits both men and women. Mm. Um, and also timing is very important, whether you're working for a corporation or a nonprofit, um, when is your budget ends, your fiscal year ends, mm -hmm. uh, you want to ask at the end and they didn't allocate those funds to even support that. So really paying attention mm -hmm. to um, how your company or nonprofit uh, puts together mm -hmm. their budget and reviews it so you could place mm -hmm. those asks mm -hmm. and keep it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does research tell us anything about negotiation success in different industries for women? Mm -hmm. Is there anything on that? Mm -hmm. What to us is interesting, we're not seeing any good trends across industries that it's, it's so much better in some industries. And in fact, what we're seeing now, which is more concerning, the industries that think they're more egalitarian and more fair and, mer and that meritocracy rules are actually not. So a lot of the tech companies, the, the startups think that, that they're more fair and, and we've seen research supports that they are not. So. Wow. Okay, let's take another question mm -hmm. from social media. All right, uh, one of our viewers wants to know, how is someone in a very low level position supposed to negotiate? I don't feel like I have enough importance at my workplace to challenge the boss. Excellent yeah. question. So that's a great question and that's a question I'll get with some of um, the individuals I would work with or groups I would work with and is that you know the challenge is that I'm in this low position how can I negotiate when I don't have I just maybe have my high school diploma or my GED and my thing is to remind them that you would not be hired there if they didn't value or want you there um, you need to really look about look at what how have you improved the um, the management or the overall success of the company that you're working in. Regardless, your, your position plays an intricate role. And so think of what tangible things are truly negotiable. 
you know, what do you really want? What is the next phase? So you have room to negotiate um, because you wouldn't be there. Um, they wouldn't have you know, offered you the position. It's just deciding on what is your next step and really making sure it's clear that these are the things you wish to, to receive. Right. So uh, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. do you start big and then back up, mm -hmm. correct? You don't start with, oh, I've only been here, yeah. you know, a year yes, and I, yeah. I only have yeah. a high school degree. Yeah. Start big and yes. come back, but um, yeah. what do you say yeah. to people about what so, they So need we, we always say a good strategy is, is go first, because if you anchored a number, you've anchored the number. So go mm -hmm. first, anchor high. And by high, the research supports that women will tend to under ask by 30%. Mm -hmm. So a good place to start is to maybe think, what would you ask for? Add 30% to that, and that could be your ask. <laughs> or what we often say in the academy is, is can it pass the giggle test? Like, can you, can you say it out loud without cracking up? Because if <laughs> the, the problem is you could be asking for something that's so big that makes people question your credibility. So I think that that is, a, right. is something to think about, but absolutely anchor high, because that's the number that, you, that you're gonna be negotiating down from. So go, go high, think 30% more than where you are, and, and can you say it out loud without laughing, okay. I think. And another thing to add is think about who are your male colleagues? that you can get feedback. So you might not ask them, how much are you making <laughs> for this job? But you might ask them, hey, I've been offered this position at X amount of dollars with these benefits. Is this something you would be willing to accept? Because that could actually help you gauge um, where you are. Are you undervaluing yourselves or should you be reaching a lot higher? Right. Okay, let's take another social media question. We have another question from Twitter. It's from Matthew who asks, is it appropriate to ask an employer what their salary ceiling is mm -hmm. if they do not advertise in their job posting? And a similar question from Jamie on Twitter. If we're not privy to salary and wage information for other coworkers, how do we know if we're paid fairly? Yeah, and you start walking around the office asking people salaries, big problems take place. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle this? Mm -hmm. so, so what to me, I, to me, sorry, there are lots of thoughts there, but, but abs I think it's absolutely fair enough. When you are being offered a job, it's normally within a scale range. So mm -hmm. I think it's fair enough to say what is the top and bottom of the scale range and why did you, you know, what, what are you advertising it at what level? So I think it is, it's absolutely fair enough for someone to be asking what is the top scale range in, in the scale that you're going to be recruiting me into. So I, I think it's, it's a good way to go. I think it's very helpful to go to mm -hmm. HR if you know you're being recruited at a certain level in the organization and ask what are the, the salary ranges within certain areas. And, and I think in some environments you can ask colleagues what they are earning, but to your point, I think you need to understand what you could be opening up. And at at the same time, I think, you know, watching in the university environments, there are a lot of alumni that you could be asking questions of or networks. And if you're not coming out of that environment, ask your friends, ask other people who you know may work there to, to gather information. I think we often feel we can't ask around to find out mm -hmm. what that number is. And I think you'd be surprised at how people are wanting to help you with that. Yeah. Lots of ways to do research. Definitely. And as I said before, um, you know, you could ask someone, who you work with, but not ask them directly how much they make, but you'd be willing to disclose that information that you have just to get a, you know, they might tell you, hey, I would mm. actually ask for 10 or 15,000 more, I would ask for mm. these added bonuses too, so. Yeah. And you touched earlier on timing, mm -hmm. and that timing's a factor, and um, mm. it, are there times, it, it's better to ask, obviously, when they're planning the budget, yeah. mm -hmm. um, any other time, um, you know, there was a study, and I should just yeah. read this now. 61% yeah. of respondents said the economy plays a large yeah. part in whether or not they decide to negotiate a salary. Yeah. Um, should we even bother to negotiate pay and other benefits when the country is struggling economically? Well, here's the thing I like to tell, um, you know, organizations or corporations or individuals, I would say, they wouldn't even have that position posted or even offer you or have it available if they didn't allocate funds to hire you and make room for its negotiation to proceed. So uh, you should be encouraged to still negotiate regardless of what mm -hmm. the, was happening in the economy. Um, they wouldn't have offered you that position mm -hmm. in the first place. And if you're there, the worst they could say is no, which isn't a bad thing. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I say definitely, regardless of this mm -hmm. situation that's happening mm -hmm. in the economy, you should definitely still negotiate. And, and I think employers are desperate for good talent mm -hmm. and so if you're good they want to keep you or they want to offer something so I, I I think if you know you're good I would never let the economy stand in the way of that yes. and so, so outside of keeping in mind when the fiscal year takes place and when yeah. the budget process any timings internally people should be aware of or or um, keep in mind 
for me, it's always, I, I believe in consistently advocating every time you've shown value to the organization in a specific way mm -hmm. is to, to bring it up in, in gentle ways, in meetings, in maybe not so subtle ways. But I think it's to constantly remind an organization of the value you deliver because I think we forget and we're also busy that when it comes to annual salary review, they're not thinking what you did nine months ago when you right. bought an amazing client. So I think it's to keep that list of what you're bringing in and to, to keep advertising what you bring in and in a way that's appropriate should negotiations always be in person is there ever a time where it's better to negotiate in writing I, I strongly recommend definitely negotiating in person as the first choice because there's a lot of nuances to negotiating right your body language uh, you can start cueing into these am I going left field with this ask if I'm making if I'm making the other person uncomfortable I'm making too big of an ask am I being realistic so it's definitely better to do it in person because uh, you can read off of one another in terms of whether or not it's going, you know, an appropriate ask. Um, if the person is understanding and hearing you clearly about what, how you're substanti substantiating your results and the benefits to the company that you're employed with. So definitely um, in person because if you do email, how many times have you may have received an email and you might have thought that someone might have been upset with you, right. but you just read it incorrectly. You took a different tone mm -hmm. from it. So it's, you know, in-person communication definitely mm -hmm. is the best way to go. If I could just add that, I think it also depends on timing. Mm -hmm. We know face-to-face -face speeds up a negotiation, email can slow it down. So okay. I, I, I mean, the ultimate is face-to-face. -face. We can get clarity, get everything on the table, build ideas. I think if you're trying to slow a negotiation down, you could could look at email or other ways of doing it. So, so mm -hmm. one speeds it up and one slows it down. So again, that could be part of how you think of your negotiation strategy going in. Right, and you both have already spoken about have your list ready, go mm -hmm. through in your mind yes. the accomplishments yes. and, and why you are yeah. valuable to that organization yes. and why you yes. need to move yeah. forward. So yeah. I'm curious, yes. are the women that you work with and the yeah. conversations that we've been having tonight yeah. about negotiation, um, are these only for corporate America jobs? We had a question about, yeah. you know, yeah. um, lower paying yeah. jobs or service yeah. jobs. Can someone in a service job negotiate? Oh, yes. Um, negotiation is something that can be applied not only to your professional life, but also your personal life. So learning how to negotiate, whether you're in a service job or in a corporate job, uh, is something of value to everyone. Um, at Progress, we work with not only women, but also girls and college students. So you're at completely different levels, but it's definitely preparing yourself in terms of what are your plans for yourself and your future um, and how to take the right steps. So regardless of the position or the job or the industry that you're in, you should definitely still be advocating on your own behalf. And it's opening up the doors for others to advocate too. So not only are you helping yourself, you're changing the culture, hopefully within the company. Yeah. And I think your point, Tonya, is the notion of really being prepared. You know, I think, mm -hmm. as we can see, women often don't want to negotiate, so they don't prepare, they do it quickly, they rush in, they hope they can get it over with quickly. Mm -hmm. we're, we're one of the most important parts of a negotiation is how prepared you are. So regardless of industry, have you really thought through what you can ask, what you can't ask, what do you have as value? A any good planning will take you through that. And I know at the Academy, the thing women take away always and talk about is, is a template that we take them through. But any person, if you Google negotiation templates, you would be surprised at how many processes that are out there that'll just help you think through mm -hmm. any negotiation, regardless of what level. So I would just, if nothing more, for women to be really prepared, regardless of That's position definitely. or industry. Right. Excellent point, and we'll continue this conversation, but I want to take a moment to remind you that as part of our Closing the Gap campaign, we're inviting you to share your comments and questions about the gender wage gap by uploading videos to our website. Upload your video and then look for your comment or question in an upcoming Closing the Gap webcast special. We want to hear what you have to say about closing the gender pay gap. My name is Amber and I'm from Bronx, New York. I'm Stephanie from Ohio. I'm Maddie and I'm from Pittsburgh. I'm from California. I'm from Pennsylvania. And I'm from Chicago. Visit our website and upload a video with your questions. My name is Lee, I live in Virginia, and my question to you all is, why do you think that the pay gap is still such an issue in 2015? How should we better go about enforcing the idea that women should be paid equally to men? Do you find that you have to ask for raises, and have you experienced repercussions for doing so? Tell us lessons you learned the hard way. I should have stood up for myself. 
Do not be afraid to ask for your review and do not be afraid to ask for your raise. Offer your words of advice. Wage gap hits African American and Latina women hardest. To all my sisters of color out there, I have a message for you. Never stop doing and never stop trying. If I ever had a wife and a daughter, you know, I would want them to be paid fairly. I wouldn't want them to be taken advantage of at all. And tell us what you're doing to help close the gender pay gap in your own life. I want you to take those negative statistics and let them fuel you to be great. Visit www.womenwagegap.org and upload your video today. Together, we can speed up the process of closing the gap. We appreciate your questions, and right now, we're going to answer one of them. My name is Lee, I live in Virginia, and my question to you all is, why do you think that the pay gap is still such an issue in 2015? Some people think the wage gap is entirely about gender discrimination, and discrimination is part of the problem, but it's not the only factor. The wage gap is caused by a complex set of factors, causing women to earn less money overall in their lifetimes than men earn. Here's the whole story. Women make up half the workforce, and six out of every 10 American families rely on women's paychecks to make ends meet. My daughter, she's a breadwinner. She works hard for her money. Right now, my wife makes more than me. Yet, U.S. Census Bureau statistics show there is no industry in America where women earn more than men. For most women, they are in the workplace because they need to be working and they need the economic security. Deborah Brake specializes in employment discrimination law and gender law, and she testified twice in Congress in support of fair pay legislation. It's a highly politicized and hotly debated topic. Democrats want you to believe that Republicans do not support women. So far, Republicans in Congress have been gumming up the works. This statistic is the lightning rod for a lot of the argument. Today, the average full-time working woman earns just 77 cents for every dollar a man earns. It's a statistic that's easy to misinterpret and to manipulate. The big question that gets buried in the politicized fray is this, why? Why is the wage gap even wider for women of color? Why do so many women work in low-paying service jobs? Why do women with college degrees tend to pursue lower-paying occupations than men? Why do they tend to have shorter work histories than men? And why do women experience more career interruptions to care for family members? The answers reveal many gaps in many areas, and women feel the collective effect in their paychecks. I think, first of all, the, the you know, 77 cents on the dollar is an important number because it's a benchmark across time compared to men. Uh, that becomes probably a sound bite that every reporter can grab and, and every story can focus on. After that, though, it's a lot more complicated. Sabina Dietrich conducts research on economic and community development, and she studied the range of factors that contribute to the wage gap. We looked at uh, gender wage gaps by age groups, by industries, by occupations across metropolitan areas in the country, and found that the places that had the best wages were the faster growing metropolitan areas. Civil service matters. Um, Unions matter. State legislation can matter if you've got living wage legislation. Those are all parts of the reason for the wage gap persisting. I think of it more as lost opportunity. For doing the amount of work that you're doing, you're not going to be bringing home as much as you should be for them. If we're going to value the work that people do, I mean, a lot of us are underpaid as it is. What does the wage gap mean for the financial security of America's families and for the economic security of the country as a whole? Families absolutely need women's income, which makes it an issue of family security as much as a women's issue. It's a women's issue, it's, it's a country's issue, it's a, a civil issue, uh, it's an equality issue. So the gender pay gap is caused by many factors that lead to lost wages over a lifetime, including stereotypes and biases women battle when they negotiate in the workplace. We're taking your questions on that topic, so let's go to our social media team right now to hear what's on your mind. This question is from Samantha from New Jersey. She asked via Twitter, should negotiating be approached differently in the nonprofit sector versus the for-profit sector? 
Ah, that's an excellent mm -hmm. question. Because um, a nonprofit, everybody's always like, we're doing it for someone else, and there's not mm -hmm. a lot of money here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I've you know worked in a nonprofit sector, and I, I, I think the same thing plays a role in terms of that. You want qualified, skilled, long-term um, employees, and you, so they want to retain you and they're not gonna know that you're looking for certain opportunities. And so it's better definitely to negotiate while you're there. I, mm -hmm. One thing that you might do is definitely, also with a for-profit, is remind yourself to think of their funding cycle um, because they might need to build in uh, the new resources to do a cost adjustment to your, your salary if that's what you're looking to negotiate. Um, but you should definitely still negotiate mm -hmm. uh, yeah. at a nonprofit sector, with okay. a nonprofit sector. We'll take another social media question. This is from Twitter, from Katie from Kalamazoo. And she asks, how do we overcome racial stereotypes when negotiating? Good question. And I guess the first question, do they exist? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, a woman who's an African-American woman, uh, the perception might be that you know she doesn't want to come off also as too aggressive because she's automatically um, labeled derogatory terms because she's being too assertive. Um, but you know, as uh, you know, Euro-American women also face that same backlash. But um, it, it, I think it's even more so challenging if you're a woman of color uh, trying to negotiate versus if you weren't. Um, and because um, there's still those same perceptions, you got to be aware of what are the perceptions that are in society uh, based on your race. Mm -hmm. Leanne, your thoughts on this? I, I come back to the same two points which I don't want to make but are important. It's I think it's the demeanor always during any negotiation for a woman. I think you would like to think it's different. It's not. So, so to keep a very composed demeanor during a negotiation and secondly to legitimize it, to explain why you're asking for what you're asking for. And, and I know that's frustrating and none of us ever want to hear that. But though. I would advise all women those two things because I think those are the stereotypes that you're bumping up against. You should not be asking for yourself or you should be asking in a way that's demure and so that's the struggle. So how, how do you counteract that? By being composed, niceness with insistence but at the same time legitimizing why you're asking for what you're asking. Legitimize, legitimize, legitimize. It's very frustrating, <laughs> it is. Yeah. No, but it's, it's great it's, advice. Yeah, and yeah. We'll take another social media yeah. question. Okay, uh, Kimmy submitted this question through Facebook. During an initial interview, is it appropriate to start negotiating salary? And we also have a related question that asks, what's the earliest you should start negotiating a salary? Very good. I, I, I mean, I, I think start early always because I think you want to anchor high. So, so I, think, I think it's good to anchor high. I think though, often initial, I'm, I'm saying anchor high, but at the same time, if you think of work environments and how you're being assessed during your initial interviews, I think your initial interviews are more information gathering. So I don't yeah. see it as negotiating mm -hmm. as opposed to what are the frames, this is what I would be looking at. It can be intimidating to the job application yes. that says salary range yes. or yes. amount of money you made in yes. your last job. Should yes. you increase that by 30% Absol when you write it on your application? <laughs> Absolutely, I would. Absolutely. Yeah. Or you might yeah. want to leave it open if you can. Yeah. So that always doesn't lock you into mm -hmm. a, a certain, especially if you're doing things electronically. Um, you might just want to leave it open so mm -hmm. you could mm -hmm. gather that information during the interview process mm -hmm. uh, to get an idea of what the mm -hmm. what's involved in the position because the skill sets you might have more than what's being there so you'll be asking for more anyway mm -hmm. right. okay we'll take another social media question this question is from sasha on facebook what's the biggest negotiation mistake that you have made and what did you learn from it and a related question was what mistakes should we avoid Good point, thank you. I've <laughs> made the mistake of um, just not negotiating in terms of that I waited till I was too frustrated and angry and I just pretty much said, um, you must not want me to quit uh, versus having the conversation, the dialogue all along. Um, and what I realized at that time was that the, my boss wasn't even aware because I never had that mm. ongoing conversation right or that persistence or ha you know, about what I was hoping, what goals, uh, wasn't even aware that I was even dissatisfied. But mm -hmm. I just made that assumption because I saw people promoted and this happens. You know, you see people promoted and you're thinking, gosh, they never, they keep overlooking me. Mm -hmm. And I'm staying, mm -hmm. doing all these different jobs and staying for and long hours. But yeah. 
on the boss's behalf, they had no, no idea, idea that I had these concerns. Mm. Leanne, your mistake? M my mistake is I always want to settle too quickly, consistently. I, you know, we know we need to negotiate, I map it out, I go round one, I get to round two, and then I just want to make it, I want to, I want to get it finished. And, and I think that's when you leave way too much on the table and you start going, well, this sounds fair. Like I'm giving this, they're giving this, it sounds fair. And so I, my mistake is not going third and fourth rounds and just slowing it down, slowing right. it down, really mapping out, is it fair? What are you giving up? What are you taking? What is the package as opposed to the issue? Right. Um, so, so that's, I know I make mistake. I just, I want to get it finished. But now you're helping everyone else from not <laughs> making mistakes. Oh yeah, and I don't make that <laughs> mistake anymore, by the way. <laughs> right. well, we'll take one more social media question. Yeah. This is from Facebook and there's similar questions from Gabrielle and Sasha. Can your guests give an instance where you regret not negotiating well why it went wrong, yeah. and what you would have done differently. Yeah, okay. so repeated the question, sort of, that yes. we just had. Yeah. Um, so you leave people with never be afraid. Never be yeah. afraid. You need yeah. to negotiate. You definitely do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So I want to ask a question. We were talking off camera um, mm -hmm. about it, it, when we were talking about cultivating relationships in the workplace mm -hmm. and trying to figure out who you can ask. Mm -hmm. um, what's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor mm -hmm. in the workplace? We hear a lot about women mm -hmm. mentors. What's the difference between a mentor and a sponsor, and who is better equipped? to help you and how? I, I mean, a mentor is, if you could think of, is that person you're leaning on for just some advice. Um, it could be pretty much, I hate to use this term, like a, cry, a shoulder to cry on um, when you're, you have frustration. Your sponsor is someone who's really your champion and they're really pushing you through and making sure you're as successful as possible because you're almost as their brand, they're so encouraged that you will be a successful person. They see a position open. They're informed about the work and the results that you've illustrated or demonstrated at the workplace. So they will help advocate on your behalf or bring awareness that there's you know, professional opportunities right. for you because they understand what your goals are. So they're more of um, helping you navigate the, I would say, the organizational structure within your company yeah. while a mentor is someone who just provides that guidance and support. Yeah. So to add, to, yeah, yeah. to add on to that point, I, I think sponsors are interested in you based on their self-interest, not mm -hmm. out of the goodness of their heart. A mentor wants to be kind and nice and supportive out of the goodness of the heart. A sponsor's doing it because they really like what you bring, they want you on their team, you make them look good. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to negotiation, a mentor can be a wonderful place to go, a person to go to, to get better. The right. si behind the scenes information. What are people really asking for all of that? Because he, he or she is there to support you. You'll often right. be negotiating almost yeah. with your sponsor because he'll right. be pulling you into team. So right. you, you'll need your mentor's insight. But if you want something, your sponsor is the person who'll have your back. So right. he's the or she is the person you'll go to and say, could you advocate for me in that? Or could you help me with right. this negotiation? So I think that they both have a role to play, just different yeah. roles. Just, uh, okay. So it's amazing. We only have about two minutes yeah. left. So yeah. I want to leave people with some yes. really concrete things. Yes. What are the words you should use? Yes. How do you begin the ask? Yes. Leanne, I walk into my boss yes. and I say, what? Yes. Yes. T to me, I think it's just to learn to have fun with it. What to me is important, we've spoken so much about salary, when negotiation is about a comportment, it's about asking for everything. Can I do this? Can I do that? And so in the academy, we encourage someone for the first month just to ask for things you'll never get. So I would encourage all your viewers to go and ask for a discount on gas. One of our co-founders, I know, look how you're looking at me, and it was lovely. She would go across states, the Midwest, and ask, at garages and different petrol stations asking for a discount on gas. H have fun with it. You'll, you'll be surprised at people will throw in chips or a Coke or something just to see when you start asking how people do want to meet you there. So it's, it's just learning to ask it's and not take yourself so seriously. Right. With okay. it. So it's changing the mindset. Yeah. So my mindset yes. is starting to change. Yes. I've made my list of yes. all these wonderful things I've done yes. at work. I yes. walk into my boss's office and I say, do you have a minute yeah. or is that the wrong term, how do I begin to say, I deserve a raise? There's not a script in terms of, do you have a minute? I mean, you know your boss best. So uh, you wanna make sure that the, you, know, you, you schedule time to meet with them and you, it's going in as a discussion. So you're gonna discuss, okay, uh, I'm very glad to be a part of this company um, and I, I believe that you value the work that I've done and these are all my achievements and this is how it's benefited the company. Um, with that, I was hired uh, doing with this certain job title and these skills. And 
here, look how, and you're presenting it, how I've grown and developed. And so you ask for that adjustment. Do at you that ever time. say, I know Sarah, I know Betty, I know Tom makes more money than I do, and I do a better job? I, I, you really want to put it based on what you are giving. And you will have done your research knowing um, whether or not you're making a realistic ask for the, the results that you've achieved. Right. So um, you're, it's about you and what you want and knowing what your value is. Right. Well, I can't believe we are out of time. We thank oh, you wow. both so much. That's all the time we have today. Thank you to our guests here in the studio, Leanne Meyer, Executive Coach and Program Director of the Carnegie Mellon Leadership and Negotiation Academy for Women, and Ayanna Ledford, Executive Director of the Program for Research and Out Outreach on Gender Equity. Thank you both so much for all the information that you shared today. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. We'd love to hear your feedback about today's program. And we invite you to take a brief survey online at womenwagegap.org forward slash survey. We hope this Closing the Gap special has inspired you to approach negotiations with more confidence. We also hope you'll continue the conversation at work in social media in your community and with your representatives in government. Together, we can speed up the process of closing the gender pay gap. Closing the Gap, 50 Years Seeking Equal Pay is made possible by The Eden Hall Foundation seeks to improve the quality of life in Pittsburgh and southwestern Pennsylvania. Through the lens of women's issues, it continues the stewardship of Sebastian Mueller in the areas of human services, health, education, and the arts. And by Chatham University in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania has empowered women for 145 years, advancing women's causes with their Centers for Women in Politics, Entrepreneurship, and the new Chatham University Women's Institute opening in 2015. And these additional donors. Kathy Raphael, Buchanan Ingersoll and Rooney, PC, Georgia Berner, MSA, and the Women and Girls Foundation.